found an art gallery, but he was very upset, knowing he hardly sold a painting in a week, and he knew that if he didn't earn enough money to get on top of the bills, soon then he would have to close the gallery down. He was sitting in a bar one night, telling his friend he had to close the gallery if he could not come up with some miracle to bring in more revenue than he already was. A few minutes later he went up to the bar to buy a drink, when he realised there was a strange looking man dressed in a black suit staring right at him. Then the man handed him a card and said, I couldn't help but hear your sad story about the gallery. I have an amazing idea that will no doubt keep your gallery open. Just don't tell your friend over there or anyone else. Call me anytime. That night when Fred got home, he sat down on his sofa, wondering what the man's idea was and why he was so adamant to him not tell anyone about it. He rang the man's number and there was an answer. The man's voice spoke. Hello there, thanks so much for calling. Now I am just going to come right out with it. I have the most amazing art display this city will ever see and you can have it free of charge but you will need to shut the gallery for just 24 hours and let me and my people set it up. The main thing is that it is going to be behind reinforced bulletproof glass and should never, and I repeat, never ever open the glass. There are just two rules, that is one, don't open the glass and don't tell anyone I told you this is a guaranteed success. Before you have any questions, let me explain how this will help your gallery. This display will bring art lovers from all over the country and all over the world. It will spread like wildfire how amazing it is. Just remember, never open the glass and don't tell anyone about it. Getting back to the glass, there won't be a key, there won't be a lever to open it or a handle, but just make sure not to damage the wall around it or anything that could affect the glass. Fred could not take in what the strange man was telling him, but he felt he had no other choice to agree with the man, so he said, Okay, whatever display you have, I will shut the gallery for all of next Monday to you have it set up, but can you at least tell me what it is? The man ignored his question and said, I will see you Monday morning at 7am and also you cannot be in the gallery when it has been set up. On Tuesday morning Fred opened his gallery and wondered what the display was. He was shocked to see a very weird set of mannequins posed as in a zombie movie. He soon forgot how weird they looked when crowds of people flocked into the gallery to see the display and they loved it and also they seemed to pick up a few paintings as they stayed there. By the end of the day he had already made enough money to pay the bills that he had outstanding. He received a call from the strange man and the man asked Fred, so Fred how is it going? Fred said it was going brilliantly thanks so much, just remember the rules, don't tell anyone I told you it would turn the gallery into a success and remember don't ever have the wall or glass damaged. The call ended. Later on that night when everyone was enjoying themselves, Fred couldn't keep the secret any longer. He was speaking to a lady he admired for a long time and told her about how a man told him it would turn his gallery around and he knew that the gallery would go from strength to strength. Suddenly there was a loud noise and the room shaked. He had realized it was an earthquake. Then there was another noise and the room shaked again. The glass shattered and everyone screamed. 
as the mannequins turned into real zombies and started walking around the room, killing everyone they came across. One zombie looked right at Fred and said, You had only two rules. Don't tell anyone this was promised to bring you success. And don't break the glass. Unfortunately for you, breaking one rule led to the glass being broke. The zombie grabbed Fred and proceeded to strangle him and eat him. Then took a drink from a glass of champagne and said, It's a true saying, art imitates life. The strange man looked from across the street and said to himself, It is such a shame that poor man didn't just stick to his rules he was given. And then the strange man went about his business of looking for someone else down on their luck. My name is Darren. I have loads of people telling me that I am crazy because I tell them that I can make people do things and hypnotize them etc. I wouldn't stoop to the level of recording myself, making them act silly without their knowledge etc. Because if they don't believe me in my gifts, that's their problem, not mine. I'm not going to record them so they can look back at them acting stupid stupid and having no recollection of it. No, if they don't believe me, that is their problem. My girlfriend was arguing with me for weeks about going to see a psychologist. I wouldn't even fill on myself using my gifts on her, as the same applies for her. If she doesn't believe me, then that's her problem, not mine. But I gave in to her arguing and eventually went to see a psychologist. My girlfriend drove me to the psychologist and there wasn't a word spoken on the way there in the car. I was angry that my own girlfriend didn't believe in my powers. When I was sitting down in the psychologist's room, I felt betrayed that I had to sit here in front of someone who didn't even know me and like everyone else probably thinks I'm crazy. The psychologist was an annoying looking man who said to me, Hello Darren, my name is Frederick Ryan. I am sure you will feel a lot better after our session, but first, please tell me why you are here today. I said, I am here because everyone doesn't believe me that I have powers to make people do things against the will without them even realizing it. They have no recollection whatsoever of doing it. I am not filming anyone or anything to prove I have the gift. The psychologist said, well, Darren, I am sure you must realize why people are so reluctant in believing you. I mean, especially when they have no recollection of doing so. But Darren, I'm sure there is a good reason why you feel like you are actually doing these things. But in reality, they're just in your imagination. And when you come to the realization that you're just imagining these powers, then things will start coming together a lot easier in the puzzle. The session lasts lasted about 30 minutes. When I was out of the building I checked my phone to see the live stream I had of me making him dance around his office like an idiot without even realizing it. I laughed. I knew it was just me that filmed him and just me that will be able to watch this video. I got a thrill when I saw myself confess to making a person who annoyed me stab themselves with my powers. But then I switched back to the live feed and forwarded it up to real time right now. I didn't realize that he had actually been recording me also. Maybe he records all his subjects, but I could hear our conversation come out of his laptop speakers. 
I could see his face go weird when I was confessing about the murder. He then was getting his phone ready to make a call, more than likely the police. I used my powers to him bang the phone off his head over and over and over until it was a bloody mess and he fell down on the floor, dead. Pat was relaxing at home, enjoying a glass of whiskey, when he received a text. He opened it up, and there was a photo of his wife and daughter and son tied to a chair. He froze in fear, it had written underneath, Look under your bed, there is a burner phone attached to the left side. There is one number programmed into it. When that number rings, there will be instructions on how you can stop your family getting executed. If you go to the police, your family will be dead, so don't try anything stupid. A few minutes later, Pat had retrieved the burner phone from under his bed. He wondered should he call the number before receiving a call. He decided to call it, but there was no answer. A few seconds later he received a message. It read, I told you, when the number rings, there will be instructions. Don't call this number again. Pat was wondering, should he call the police? But decided not to. It must be some maniac has his family. What sort of sane person would do something like this, he told himself. A few minutes later, the phone rang. The voice on the other end said, Hello Pat, you will have one chance to let your family live. If you mess up that chance, then you can kiss goodbye to your family and you will never ever see them alive again. There is no GPS in this phone, but put in the following address I text you into your GPS tracking on your own phone and you will be able to have your chance of saving your family. Remember, don't go to the police. If you do go to the police, I can guarantee you right now that your family will not survive an hour after you telling the police. Now we're not going to waste any time. So you can come to the address I message you as soon as you receive it, which should be right after I hang up. The phone went dead, and sure enough, a few seconds later, an address was sent to the burner phone. Pat put the address into his GPS tracking device, and jumped in his car, and went there. The address was an old, unused warehouse, outside of town. He wondered was his family kept captive inside. As soon as he parked the car, the burner phone rang. Hello Pat, the door is open and will lock when you are inside. Walk in, I'll say on the phone. As soon as Pat was inside the door, it banged and locked behind him and the man spoke again. Well Pat, you might see an ordinary looking room with different things around it and dots on the ground. Well Pat, you are going to play a special game I designed myself, which is called Join the Dots. I was inspired by the classic game Join the Dots, hence the reason I have dots on the ground. You have to walk from each dot to the end of the room. Different things will happen you as you step on each dot. I will tell you what they are just before you step on each dot. But remember Pat, don't try to do this fast. You will know why soon. Well the first dot Pat, when you pass it there is going to be a burst of fire pop up from the floor. Also, I almost forgot. You don't have to finish any of these dots, and you won't be harmed in any way. 
if you don't even complete the first one. But on the other hand, your family will be all executed by being shot in the head. Now to make it even more exciting, there is a time limit. If you don't get it done in the time limit, which is two minutes, then you can forget about ever seeing your family alive again. Well, the game begins now. Pat was in shock with what was happening. He shouted into the phone, you sick bastard, leave my family alone. The man said, Pat, drop your phone, you don't need it. I can speak through the speakers now. You have enough on your plate besides holding a phone. By the way, Pat, the time is ticking. Pat walked fast towards the dot, and when he stepped on it, a large burning flame went up through his body and ended so fast he hadn't even caught on fire. He was walking towards the next dot, and a voice spoke. This dot is going to release nails under your feet, long enough to make you feel a lot of pain, trust me. Pat stepped on the dot and screamed in pain when two large nails went right through his feet. He walked on towards the other dot. There was only one more after that. He could do it, he told himself. The man said, the next dot, Pat, will be shards of glass forced out a chute right towards you for a few seconds. Pat walked on the dot and shards came flying at him for what seemed like hours but were only seconds. He reached the final dot and wondered what it was. He was told this is going to be a surprise. Pat, there will be two holes just big enough for you to put your arms through. Just roll up your sleeves and put them through. Pat put his arms through it hoping for it to be over. He was in fear that he was going to get his arms cut right off, but suddenly he felt a needle prick his arm. Then he felt like floating on air. He heard the voice say, Now Pat, I can't get my daughter back, but this makes me feel a little better. You might ask why the dots? Why join the dots? Well, I'll tell you why. Why? Because of all the dots from needle marks, or train tracks as they call them, in my deceased daughter's arms, from your drugs you pumped her with, and so many other people. Well, now you're going to feel what it's like to be in pain. I wondered should I give you enough to your overdose, but I had a better idea. I wanted you to experience a high before the low. You're high as a kite now, I know, but when you come down, when you come out of the clouds, you will be able to see the pain you have caused. You're going to wake up to your family dead from your poison. You see, Pat, each dot you stepped on, a person injected your poison into your family, and I'm sure they were dead by the second one. Well, on their way. But very good you did four, and good for me that it takes time for them to die. Do you remember I said you would never see your family alive again if you didn't step on the dots? I meant it. You will see your family alive. The wall raised and Pat could see his family tied to a chair, slipping more and more out of this world, with needles stuck in their arm. He knew within minutes or seconds they would be dead. The man said, now you know what your poison does to people's families. Jason was a kleptomaniac since as long back as he could remember. Ever since he could steal, 
He would. He remembers his mom used to get so mad at him when he was a small kid for stealing different items from his peers at school. His mother didn't experience anything else bad about his behavior apart from the stealing. Although there was one very distressing experience his little brother had when they were both small. They were in the woods and Jason stole his father's gun and there was a dog that seemed lost. Jason used the gun to shoot the dog dead and his brother started crying but Jason just started laughing and said come on let's get out of here. Jason's brother Simon told his mom Susan and she grounded Jason for almost a month. But when it came to stealing, he wasn't in the need for anything. He just had the impulse to steal as much as he could and as often as he could. If he was inside a restaurant, he would steal the knife and fork and sometimes even plate even though he had a many more at home that he stole. He was caught a few times and even spent a few months behind bars when he was 21. He had counselling to try to stop his impulses to steal, but nothing worked. He kept stealing as much and often as he could. One time he even stole from his own best friend. They were out for a drive. Jason's friend Jack stopped at a gas station to fill up. While his friend was inside paying, Jason stole his friend's phone and put it in a secret pocket in his bag. No one could find it there. As they were driving up a lonely road, they knew that they were in the back of the beyonds and there was no GPS in the car, so they were lost. Jack regretted driving so much out into the outback. Suddenly he was startled as a dog stood right in front of the car. The car swerved and crashed right into a tree. Jason got a flashback of years and years and years before when he shot the dog out in the woods. Jason was knocked unconscious and was in a very bad way. Jack tried to get his phone from where he left it on the car's dashboard, but could not find it. Jason was bleeding very badly and could not speak. Jason knew Jack's phone was in his secret pocket, but he could not manage to get the words out. Jack kept looking for his phone to call 911, knowing the paramedics would have to come in at least five or ten minutes at most, or else he would be gone. He knew it was too late when he saw Jason go pale and the blood began to pour out of him even more. Jason died knowing his stealing finally caught up with him.